Good morning, church. I am so happy to see you this morning. Despite my announcement last week, some of you may have been a bit surprised this morning to discover that you were up an hour earlier than you needed to be since we moved the clocks back an hour last night. Every year, it seems, I read about how lawmakers are going to abolish the daylight savings model, and yet I still keep having to move my clocks backwards and forwards like a yo-yo. Are you tired of being a yo-yo yet? (laughs) Well, all of my clocks, I suppose, except for my cell phones, my tablets, and computers, who all seem to be more in tune with our changing times than I am. While invented by Benjamin Franklin as a way to conserve his candle usage, believe it or not, daylight savings time was actually instituted first by Germany and its allies during World War I, not as a way of helping farmers, who actually have been fighting against it since its inception, but as a way of alleviating hardships due to wartime coal shortages and air raid blackouts. When the U.S. joined the war in 1917, the debate about its adoption here at home basically evaporated, and soon it went into effect. Daylight savings time came back briefly during World War II and at other times in various parts of the United States, but in 1966, the federal government passed the Uniform Time Act to try and standardize time across the United States. States could choose whether or not to opt in, but the decision had to be statewide. Today, all but Hawaii and Arizona are using daylight savings time. And the result is that we set our clocks back one hour in the fall and forward in the spring in 48 states. Human beings love messing with time. From H.G. Wells' novel, The Time Machine, to modern movies that dabble with time travel like Marvel's Avengers Endgame, we've got a fascination with visiting the past, reordering the present, and journeying far into the future. We would love to go back and visit with relatives who have passed beyond our reach or witness historical events that had significance to us, whether that is the signing of the Declaration of Independence or in the moment that our ancestors came to this land and perhaps assigned the book at Ellis Island. Even in our own minds, we we often have to be told to get out of your own head, right, and stop worrying about the future. It's no wonder that Jesus had to tell us in Matthew 6, 34, Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We like to think that modern mantras like appreciate, don't anticipate, and live in the moment are new creations, but these ideas are as old as civilization itself. They've just been rebranded and repackaged to fit into our tweets and Instagram posts. Human beings have often observed that time flies when you're having fun and seems to slow when we're not. And so we've wondered if time is really just a construction of the human mind after all. We love to rethink our relationship with time itself, and it is somewhat romantic to think that even time bends to our perception. Physicists, of course, tell us that time is really the distance between two events. If length, width, and height are the first three dimensions, then time is the fourth. Because to fully describe an event, you need to name exactly where it is in time and space, both where it is and when it happened. And yet physicists like Einstein have told us that time itself is actually relative, bending in and around gravitational fields throughout the universe like a stream flowing around rocks and getting lost into its eddies. There are places in the universe, such as on the event horizon of a black hole, where time would actually appear to stop from an outside perspective. Due to redshift, that is. Although if you were able to survive being there, you would need to actually experience time stopping. So, even science seems to tell us that time is more fluid than humanity first thought, although the ability to change it still lies just beyond humanity's reach. It's no wonder, then, that we have texts like the Book of Revelation in the Bible. It reads like a confusing movie script, doesn't it? Metaphors get compounded upon metaphors. Time seems to loop back on itself if you read Revelation from beginning to end, and it serves as a commentary on historical events that we haven't been thinking about probably in the last 2,000 years. Contrary to the way that it's often been used, Revelation is not a roadmap on how to survive the end times. It is a book meant to encourage the saints to struggle and with strife. Jesus tells us that nobody knows when that day or hour will come, not the heavenly angels and not the Son. Only the Father knows. Matthew 20, verse 13. Revelation, however, is still worth studying. 
Its symbolism and connection to ancient historical events are a powerful witness to the power of faith and to overcome great obstacles. Revelation can also give us courage to hold fast to our Christian principles and keep serving God when our strength is tested. Revelation makes plain that this world is on a path to devastation if it does not have God. Those who reject Christ's call to step away from evil, sin, injustice, and violence will leave this world doomed to the fatal cycles of sin and suffering and eventual death. What Brian McLaren describes as humanity's suicide machine and everything must change, will continue to ramble on until there is nothing left of our humanity or the planet. But the point of the book of Revelation is to provoke Christians who felt like the whole world was ending, to persevere in faith, and trust that God will ultimately be victorious and bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. Because so much of the inertia of our societies is towards the insanity of murder and service to greed, exclusion and service to to self-preservation, and feeding our vices instead of nurturing our virtues. Revelation begs of us to see the end of the road before we drive off the bridge. As Brian McLaren again summarizes, and everything must change, while most of us won't be called to sacrifice our physical lives, but many may, having faith in Jesus will lead all of us to make what an early disciple called called a living sacrifice. We will give up the life we could have lived the life we would have lived, pursuing pleasure, leisure, treasure, security, or whatever. And instead, we will live a life dedicated to replacing the suicide machine with a sacred ecosystem, a beautiful community, an insurgency of healing and peace, a creative global family, an unterror movement of faith, hope, and love. I would argue that to read Revelation through this lens Instead of picking it apart, looking for clues on how to get raptured into heaven and not have to endure the great tribulation, if you are walking with God now and are allowing God to sanctify you now, then all those details are just Bible trivia at best and a justification for escapism and ecocide at worst. Please don't misunderstand me. I believe in the second coming of Christ, the ultimate appearance of the kingdom of heaven, and the resurrection of those who have gone before us. But our God calls us to make our souls ready for Christ coming at all times. And so we work on our relationship with Christ and let Christ sanctify our hearts and lives with grace, always and everywhere. If you have not committed yourself to following Christ first and allowing the Holy Spirit to restore the image of God in you, then there is nothing more urgent and no better time than now. Claim your birthright today and let the grace of God flow through your life to deliver and save you and give you eternal, abundant life At this very moment, God's promise is true, and the time, sisters and brothers, is now. Revelation chapter 21 describes the view of the end through the vision of John of Patmos, a man who hails from the prison island of Rome. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, he pens. For the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Revelation 21 verse 1. We normally read this as a completely different earth, although Barbara R. Rossing has disputed this claim in her book, The Rapture Exposed, back in 2004, by asserting that new can also mean renewed or refreshed. Read this way, the old earth has receded like floodwaters, and the new earth restored and has taken its place. Satan has been defeated in Revelation 20, verse 10, and all of those who followed after him have been swallowed up by the lake of fire in Revelation 20, verse 14. When the earth's intentions then have been purified and we are no longer seeking after our own destruction, that's when this new earth is born. And it's at this point in John's vision that the veil is torn and he's finally able to see what he's been yearning to see all throughout this book. I saw the holy city, he says, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven as a bride beautifully dressed for her her husband. Revelation 21 verse 2. This holy city's arrival is described like a wedding day, like a long-anticipated, sacred, future-shaping moment. The appearance of the new Jerusalem is what Christ has been waiting for all this time, a time when our world will finally be a mirror of heaven. Perhaps some of you have experienced what I experienced on my wedding day, the doors of the church opening, Jennifer stepping forth in her dress, and me standing there at the altar, talking with the minister next to me and 
totally flabbergasted at what I was seeing before me. Christ will not be as surprised as I was on my wedding day to see this beautiful bride walking down the aisle. Christ already knows the beauty that is present within each of us and within our world. And yet Christ will rejoice the way that I rejoiced that day, seeing my bride walking down the aisle. Moreover, humanity will finally return to the intimacy we had with God back in the Garden of Eden. It's no surprise that the Bible uses an illustration of a romantic relationship, a kind of intimacy with the bridegroom in this wedding description or metaphor. God is trying to remind us that the intimacy that we had in the Garden of Eden is that which God is seeking to restore with us. It is the next thing that John notices as the new Jerusalem descends out of heaven, that a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his disciples. God himself will be with them as their God. Chapter 21, verse 3. What we often think of as heaven being like a place without suffering is here described as being the result of our restored relationship with God. It's not just that circumstances that cause suffering are no longer there. It is the replacement of all that suffering with the blessing of being made whole again at last. Death has been abolished because we've been reconnected with the source of our very being at the last, and God will tenderly wipe away every tear from their eyes, and all the things that caused us hurt are gone, as it says in verse 4. And this is why God proudly recalls the Garden of Eden and proclaims to to John that all is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will freely give water from the life-giving spring. I will be their God, and they will be my sons and daughters. Chapter 21, verses 6 through 7. Later in verse 23, John would note that this holy city wouldn't even need a sun or moon anymore, because God's glory is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb, as it says in chapter 21, verse 23. God's very presence among them illuminates everything. And all that was a mystery before has finally been revealed. And it's in this blessed occasion, when all is renewed and restored at last, it is this that gives us hope. Our hope isn't to be found in those who seek to replenish our country, but in those who are working for the salvation of the whole created order. Our citizenship may well be in these United States, but our ultimate allegiance is to Christ and to the new Jerusalem, our kingdom of heaven, that Christ seeks to restore. Our hope is in the wedding of bride and groom, the reunion of Jesus to his greatest love. So church, know that you are beloved by God and that Christ waits for our eventual reunion and that blessed reunion is coming. In Jesus' name, amen.